Today we're visiting one of the most famous monuments of Rome. The Pantheon's design has influenced countless buildings throughout history across Europe and the Americas. Today the Pantheon continues to function as a church as well as a major tourist destination. But before going inside, let's take a look at this amazing fountain. In the end of the 16th century, the Pope decided to provide more water to this area, one of the highly populated of Rome. He commissioned one of the most important architects of that time. Unfortunately, of the original plan of Giacomo della Porta, today remains only the basin and few other things, like the dragons from the coat of arms of the Pope's Bon Compagni family. In 1711, the Pope Clemente added the obelisk, which originally stood at the Temple of Ra in Heliopolis. The reef with dolphins and the coat of arm of his family, the Albani, were made at this point. So in the summer, this 500 years old fountain, I promise you, will refresh your visit to the Pantheon. This is one of the most important monuments for the Romans and all the Italians. It has a long history that is sometimes mixed with fanciful legends. On the facade, the great on the facade, the great writing attributes to the valiant Agrippa the construction. The inscription states: Marcus Agrippa, son of Lucius, consul for the third time built this. The year was the 27 AD. It is said that the Pantheon was built in the place where Romulus ascended to heaven. According to historians it was built to accommodate the sculptures of pagan deities. The Pantheon was rebuilt 100 years later during the reign of the Emperor Hadrian. He was an emperor like no other an artist as well as an architect. But when the empire fell, the great pantheon was abandoned to itself. The emperor of Byzantium gave it to the Pope in 608, and promptly it was consecrated to St. Mary and the Martyrs. So from the temple to all the pagan gods, it became the church to all the Christian saints. In 1652, Pope Urban VIII Barberini completed the destruction he commanded to take away all the bronze coverings of the beams of the porch. He wanted to reuse the materials for the canons of Castel Sant'Angelo, but also for the twisted columns of Bernini's canopy in San Pietro. The dome is among the world's engineering wonders. It has a diameter of 43.44 meters. It weighs over 5,000 tons. Even today it remains the largest dome in the world. In fact, that of St. Peter has 42 meters, that of Brunelleschi 41. 
The only window is 9 meters in diameter and is edged with bronze. Legend has it that inside the upward currents prevent the rain from wetting the floor. Maybe at one time with braziers and lit candles and all that heat it was possible. But today water floods the floor. So to avoid stagnations, some holes were drilled in the marble. When you get here, try to count all these holes. It's easy to see the traces of arches in the outer walls. It's a testament to the effectiveness of the arch. It's a shape that can distribute load, it can support or strengthen a structural design. The Romans did not invent the arch, but they were able to utilize it in many innovative ways. In fact, it helped them to uncover the capabilities of the standard arch. In order to support huge amounts of load, they discovered how to produce a strong building material using the combination of cementitious material and aggregate. In other words, they discovered concrete using a mixture that included lime and volcanic ash. The Romans created a very strong and durable type of concrete and arches were made of this substance that could support a considerable amount of weight as a result, Romans were able to design and construct massive structural supports and elements within the Pantheon. The Pantheon, after the unification of Italy, was used as a shrine for the kings of Italy that are still inside. The first is the tomb of Umberto I, who was assassinated in 1900. Umberto's wife, Queen Margherita of Savoy, is buried next to him. Believe it or not, the materials used 2,000 years ago are still here. The seven niches are preceded by pairs of columns made of pavonazzetto marble. As surprising as it may be, the floor is largely still the original one. And over here, under the Madonna del Sasso of Lorenzetto, rests Raffaello Sanzio. 
Raffaello Sanzio left this world at the age of 37. It was three o'clock in the night on April 6th in 1520. He left us all his masterpieces. His remains were buried in the Pantheon. To the right of his grave there is a tombstone in the memory of his girlfriend, Maria Bibiana. On the left is the bust of Raphael. For centuries it was not known where the painter exactly was buried. It was even though that the remains were in another church. In the early 19th century investigations began. The Pope of the time, Gregory XVI, after having found it, decided to place his remains in a Roman sarcophagus of the first century. In this way the genius had a worthy arrangement. A cardinal friend of his wanted to write his epitaph. Inscriptions reads, Here lies Raphael, by whom nature feared to be outdone while he lived, and when he died, feared that she would die with him. That has to be one of the most amazing epitaphs of all time. Raphael is one of those painters that look effortless but are not. The final version often doesn't make you see the amount of studies and different poses he tried before. Definitive version. The most difficult thing is often to make complicated things look easy. This is the tomb of King Vittorio Emanuele II, who died in 1878. He played an essential part in founding modern Italy and his memorial at the Pantheon in Rome is dedicated to the father of the homeland. But the royal family was tainted for supporting the rise of fascism in the years between the world wars and in 1938 King Vittorio Emanuele III signed racial laws that discriminated against Jews. The king eventually dismissed Mussolini in 1943, but after signing an armistice with the Allies, 
He and his government fled German-occupied Rome for Brindisi in Puglia, effectively leaving it Italy's troop leaderless. The male descendants of the family were formally exiled as punishment in 1948, two years after Italians voted in a referendum to abolish the monarchy in favor of a republican government. That ban was lifted in 2002, but the family's reputation never fully recovered. I wanted this sanctuary of all gods to represent the globe and the celestial sphere, a globe within which the seats of the eternal fire are enclosed, all contained in the hollow sphere. So Hadrian felt responsible for the beauty in the world. Some books change lives. There are novels capable of touching us deeply and determining our destiny. For me, this has happened with the memories of Hadrian, an amazing book. I hope you enjoyed this tour. In this case, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and comment down below. Let me know if you read this magnificent book already and what the most you like about the Pantheon.